All right. Um, I, I don't know if y'all got to watch the video from last week or not. I'm hoping you did. If not, you can go back. Uh, I said last week, um, I think Maley was here. Uh, we talked about that we had to, to change the way we've been doing, Mark, uh, in order to get through this. Because uh, I told you I was, I was worried about how to do this and how to get finished in time. And uh, I know coming up with summer break and uh, the end of the year, uh, it's going to get busy with y'all and with soft, uh, baseball, softball, everything happening. Uh, so what we decided to do was we decided last week because we covered three chapters of Mark. Uh, this week we covered two. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Mark chapter 15 and Mark 16. These are the last two uh, chapters of Mark. So after tonight, we will have done the complete book of Mark. Um, I hope y'all have enjoyed this class. I don't know, you may be thinking after you see this week and our last week and this week's, uh, why don't we do it this way anyway to do it, uh, do quicker and simpler. But I wanted us to go through and look at look at Mark and try to get an understanding of, of, of his gospel uh, and the life of Christ. And again, I apologize that we're, we're having to do the, the end of it this way uh, because Mark's whole book has been geared toward getting to this point. It has been showing us who the Son of God was, uh, that Jesus was the Son of God, and what he was able to accomplish, why he came to this earth, and, and what miracles he was able to do, and why he had the proofs. And this is Mark's whole gospel, and Mark, uh, the point of every gospel, uh, is to tell us who Jesus is. And so uh, a big part of Jesus' story is this, the, the end, uh, the, the last week, uh, and the crucifixion. Again, as we have told you a few weeks ago, Mark's gospel, 16 chapters, Mark begins in about chapter 11 uh, to talk about the last week. Uh, uh, the last few chapters of Mark are all about the last week. So uh, what that means is Mark spends four or five chapters on the last week, six chapters on the last week versus 10 chapters on the previous two and a half, three years. Uh, so that shows where Mark's focus is. And it's not just Mark. Uh, John does the same thing. Luke, uh, Matthew, they all spend the majority of time talking about the last week. And uh, I sort of apologize again that we're having to speed through the last week because of its importance. Uh, but that's just sort of where we have to go. Uh, you remember last week, uh, we talked about Mark 14. That was Jesus' betrayal, uh, his handing over to Pilate, or handing over to the Sanhedrin, uh, of how Judas betrayed him for the price of 30 pieces of silver. Uh, then we talked about... Uh, Peter, the last thing we talked about last week was Peter uh, and his denial of Jesus uh, and of what Jesus, uh, what, when Jesus told him, you'll deny me three times for the rooster crows. And Peter says, oh, no, I'll never do that. Uh, and we know the story. They did it anyway. Uh, and he betrayed Jesus or he denied Jesus and uh, he went away and wept the rest of the night. And what happens in Mark 15 is we pick up the following morning. Now, this is the interesting thing to think about here as we go through this. Remember, Jesus on Thursday, uh, had the Last Supper with his apostles, had Passover. Uh, he's been up all night with the Sanhedrin. He's visiting the inner into Friday. We're going to read about what happens on Friday during the day uh, in his crucifixion. Uh, so Jesus, on top of having to be beaten, on top of being beaten and having all these things happening, he's also probably exhausted because he's been awake for more than 24 hours. Uh, he's been up all night. Again, he probably woke up Thursday morning, uh, and then he was busy all day Thursday. He had the feast, and then he's been just bang, bang, bang the rest of the night into uh, all these things that snowball. So uh, this is, again, part of what happens at the crucifixion uh, is that Jesus is exhausted. Uh, Jesus is, is going on, again, over 24 hours without sleep uh, when all this happens. So uh, chapter 15, we see Jesus getting taken to Pilate. Uh, we see uh, Jesus goes before Pilate. The first five verses, we see Jesus is, uh, or Pilate's amazement at Jesus because the Jews come and accuse him uh, of, uh, of, of blasphemy. They accuse him of rebelling against Rome, and, and Jesus doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't open his mouth. Uh, he doesn't argue with Pilate. He doesn't try to say, no, they're wrong. This is what it really was. Uh, you've misunderstood the situation. Uh, any of those things, Jesus is just uh, saying there. And, and what we see, I don't remember if it's Mark or one of the other Gospels that tells us, uh, but Jesus will tell Pilate, uh, what you're doing, you couldn't do unless God was giving you the authority, unless God allowed you to do it. Uh, so there's no point in speaking to you. And the idea is he was telling Pilate, uh, Pilate, uh, you're going to do what, what the plan was, no matter what. What? 
uh, because this is what uh, God's intended purpose from the beginning was. And so we see this idea that Jesus stands before Pilate and doesn't argue and, and try to get out of this. And so uh, Pilate is amazed, uh, and that leads to the second part, in that Pilate then remembers about a, uh, about a um, I don't know if you call it, I guess a tradition they had, uh, and that was that uh, typically on the eve of a feast or the day of a feast, he would set a prisoner free. Uh, he would release a prisoner, of, of, and he calls out these two prisoners. He brings Jesus up, and he also brings forth Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a, uh, a, a man who was... Um, one who tried to cause riots. Uh, he was a man who tried to cause problems. Uh, a lot of people think that the way Barabbas is described, that he was a, a, a what's called a rebel rouser, uh, and that he tried to get people to, re to rebel against Rome and to fight against Rome. Uh, he wasn't very well taken. He was, uh, he's a murderer. Uh, and so he sets one of the worst criminals ahead of him. And, and what's interesting about this is that when you think about the, the situation is that Jesus is handed over to Pilate that day, but yet the Romans have a cross ready to go. Uh, typically, it wasn't a simple thing to have a cross ready for crucifixion. Uh, so what that tells us, and I, and I say all that to get to this point, is that most likely the cross Jesus was on, it wasn't his cross. This was Barabbas's cross. This was a cross that the, the Romans had prepared for Barabbas and these two uh, criminals who are going to be crucified with Jesus, that this was where they're going to die. This is how they're going to be executed that very day. And this Barabbas was known as a, a, as a troublemaker, as a murderer. And so he brings forth Jesus and he knows that Jesus is just here because the chief priests, the main people, the Jews don't like him. And so Jesus, Pilate thinks, if I give everybody the option, they're going to choose Barabbas. They're not going to choose Jesus because uh, only the higher ups hate Jesus. Well, uh, we know the story. They say, well, he asked, what do you want me to do? And, and they, they say, give us Barabbas. Uh, give us the rebel, the, the, the rebel rouser. Uh, and G Pilate says, what do you want me to do with Jesus? The one who called Jesus. And, and you remember the people cry out there in verse 12 through verse 15. And they cry out. And the words used here for cried out is they cried out continually. They chanted. And they chant over and over and over and over again, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And this leads into the uh, question we've looked at earlier. Remember when we talked about chapter 11, this is the same Jesus who on the, the Sunday before, when they brought Jesus in, they laid the palm branches out before him. They cried out, Hosanna to the King of Kings, Hosanna to the King of David, Hosanna to the Messiah. But yet here they are a few days later crying out, kill him, kill him, put him to death. Now, what some people think, and, and it may be true, is that the ones who lay off the palm branches and cry out son of David to try him out as Messiah, they're the people who have followed him from north. They have followed him down into uh, Jerusalem. They're not the people that live in Jerusalem. This crowd that's crying out, crucify him, crucify him. These are the Jerusalem people, and they're under the more of the heavy sway of the leaders than the other people were. So this is why there's, uh, that's the best explanation why there's this huge shift between one week crying out, uh, Hosanna, praise God for you, and the next, the very end of that same week, crying out, kill him, kill him. Uh, and I think it's made up of mostly two different groups of people. And so uh, Pilate again cries out, but this man has done nothing wrong. He tries to save Jesus. He does everything he can to, to save Jesus, you know, and, and uh, the, the, the Jews just will not have it. They, they want Jesus killed. Now, we may look and say, well, why didn't Pilate do something? Well, Pilate knew this was wrong. Pilate knew what was, what was happening. Why didn't he stop them? Well, part of the reason he didn't stop them is because Pilate uh, was in trouble because the Jews had already caused problems for Romans before this. And Pilate was on his last straw, if you will. Uh, the Roman authorities told Pilate that if the Jews rebelled and fought again, that they were going to strip him of his governorhood. They were going to strip him of his power. Uh, they were going to arrest him. They were going to get rid of him. And so Pilate uh, is, tries to work this out, but the Jewish leaders tell him that if you let this man go, we're going to tell Rome that you let go of a, a, a will you let a, a foreign uh, op opposing, excuse me, opposing king go. So this is partly why Pilate bows to their will. He gives them Jesus. And so we see in verse 16 and 20, the soldiers begin to mock him. 
Uh, they, they take that robe off Jesus. They beat him with the whip. Uh, they scourge him. And again, we talked about this uh, on Sundays. Uh, they had that whip that had nine pieces of leather attached to it. It's called a cat of nine tails. And on some of those ends of those leather, of those leather strips, they have rocks pottery tied into it and basically what this whip would do is it would be swung into the victim's back and, and it was clearly a victim uh who was being crucified and it would dig into their flesh and it would rip off flesh uh, chunks of flesh with it not a pretty picture at all uh but jesus endured this um and then the soldiers put this purple robe on him and the crown of thorns on his head. Uh, and it says they take the scepter and beat him on the head with it to drive that crown down further. And they mock him and they cry out to, to, to him as a king of the Jews. Uh, and they mock Jesus. And, and, and the, the, this, this scourging was so bad that there were a lot of prisoners, a lot of men who are sentenced to be executed by the cross uh, that died in the scourging before the cross and in, in the preparation for the cross, if you will. And then we see Jesus is forced to carry the cross. Now, when he carried, when it says he carries the cross, he didn't carry the whole cross. Uh, he carried what the cross beam was. You know, uh, there's the vertical bar that went straight up and down there. It's a cross beam where his arms were attached. Uh, he would have carried that cross beam. And what happens is Jesus begins to walk. And, and the weight of that cross beam, uh, some people say it probably at least 75, 100, if not more pounds, is too much for him to bear. And then the Romans grabbed a man named, uh, named Simon of Cyrene, a man from Africa, who's there to celebrate the Passover. The, the, the Romans don't give him a choice. They don't ask him if they want to help. They basically grab him, throw him in, out of the crowd, and tell him to carry this cross, uh, to walk with this prisoner, to walk with this man to his death. And this is what Simon of Cyrene has to do, because if you don't, the Romans are going to beat him. They're going to arrest him, and, and they may crucify him. So he has to bear the cross of this criminal. Uh, they get to, to Matthew chapter 15, verse 23 through 28. They begin to uh, to crucify him. And, and in crucifying him, there's a few things that happen. Uh, number one, they offer him wine. They offer him a, a wine uh, mixed with gall, I believe it is, or vinegar mixed with gall. Some, high trans, some translations say it. Uh, and what this was, was this is a deadening agent. Uh, this is something that, that, the, that the prisoners would drink uh, to, or they would have a drink that would, that would sort of numb their body uh, so the pain wouldn't be so intense. And Jesus refuses this. Well, why did he do that? Well, because he didn't want to be, I guess you say, out of his mind. Uh, he wanted to be in full control as he suffered this crucifixion. Uh, and he did that because he knew what was at stake. He knew that it was not necessarily for him, but for us, that he needed to suffer this way. And then we read about the crucifixion, the idea that his arms are outstretched or nailed to that cross beam. Uh, his feet were, were nailed to the cross. Uh, and, and, he, and the way he would, uh, the way the cross killed you was it would suffocate you. Uh, you would have to push uh, up on your whole body to get up to breathe. You'd have to push on those nails and on that feet uh, to put all your weight on those, on those joints to stand up to breathe. And it would be so excruciating that you can only breathe for so long and then you'd fall back down. And well, when you fell back down and your arms were above your head, you begin to drown. You slowly begin to drown in your own liquid. Uh, and so this is how the cross would kill you. And, and typically the cross could take days to kill somebody. Uh, the cross was one of the meanest, uh, worst executions ever devised in the history of, of mankind. And this is how Jesus died. Now, one of the things they would do, the last part of this verse, this section of scripture, is they divide his garments. Uh, Jesus had on a, a, a robe, and Jesus had on a robe that was very nice. Uh, it was made of one piece. It wasn't the, it, typically you'd have a robe that have a couple pieces sewn together. This was one big piece of fabric that had a head, hole for the head and a hole for his arms, and it would be fitted uh, and very nice for that time. Probably one of, the, one of the women who followed him had made this for him. And so the Roman soldiers, they see this nice garment and they say, we're not going to rip this apart. We're not going to tear this apart. What we're going to do is we're going to cast lots for his garments. We're going to cast a lot for this piece of robe uh, to see who gets it. And that's how they would do is what they would do. They would arrest someone and they would bring him up, whatever he had on him. Uh, the guards who <clears throat> were watching over his death, they would split up whatever possessions he had on him. And so this is what they would do. And so this is this dividing the garments. And so they cast lots and they, and they divide the garment of Jesus. 
Uh, then verses 29 through 32, you have the Jews march underneath him and they cry out to him uh, saying, if he was truly the son of God, if he was truly Messiah, let him come down. Uh, he saved others, yet he cannot save himself. Uh, surely if he was really the son of God, he could do something about this death. And they mocked him. And they mocked him until the darkness came. And they probably marked him after the darkness. The darkness came upon the land, I believe it was the sixth hour, about the third hour of the day is when they put him on the cross. It's nine o'clock, nine in the morning. Uh, they start at 6 a.m. Three hours at nine, they put him on the cross. And then from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness from 12 to three o'clock. Now imagine that for a second. This is something I think we sometimes miss is that uh, it was dark in the middle of the day. You know, uh, a few years ago, we had an eclipse, and we have a eclipse every once in a while. Uh, it's pretty neat to go outside in the middle of the day when it's supposed to be bright and sunny, and all of a sudden, the sun gets blocked out, and, and the sun gets blocked out, but it only gets blocked out for, for just a few seconds as the sun passes or the moon passes by, it, and then it's gone. Imagine it being dark in the middle of the day for, for three hours. No, Not the clouds, not covered with clouds, not, not stormy, but just dark. The sun is gone. Uh, I've often wondered what that must have looked like. And that's what the Jews saw here. They, the Jews saw it. The Romans saw it. And there was darkness over the land until the third hour, until the ninth hour, until three o'clock. And at 3 p.m., that's when Jesus died. That's when he cries out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, that's the idea is not until this later part until Jesus cries out after everything is done that he cries out to God to to save him uh, and that's when he takes the wine they offered him earlier he takes some of it because his pain is so excruciating he's done his mission and now he can die in peace and then as soon as he dies it says the veil of the temple is written too now there was interesting about that veil of the temple the veil of the temple separated the holy place from the most holy place the most holy place was a place that the only the high priest could go once a year because that's where god dwelt that was where the ark was that was where god's presence was uh the priest could come into the holy place but they couldn't go in the most holy place only the high priest once a year but when jesus died that veil was rent that veil was torn into and split open and that was a sign of what Jesus had done in that Jesus had opened access to God by this death. Knowing that, you have the centurion. Uh, a centurion is a man who's over 100 soldiers, a Roman soldier who's at the foot of the cross. He sees Jesus' death. He sees the, the veil. He hears about the veil. He sees the darkness. There's earthquake, a huge event. And he makes a statement of surely this was the son of God or a son or a son of a God. Uh, again, being a Roman, he didn't believe in the God we believed in, but he probably believed this was son of a God. Uh, he didn't, he noted that there was something special about this. And so this is very important that a Roman soldier admitted that there was something special about this man. And then finally we see the women. There's women watching this, all this happening. There's a group of women at a distance watching all these things come to pass. And they're going to watch and see where they bury the body because they're going to go take care of the body. And that's what we see in verse 42 through 47 is that Joseph of Arimathea comes and takes the body of Jesus off the cross. Uh, he, he carries it to his own tomb that's nearby. He, he puts the body in the tomb uh, and leaves it there. And this is all on Friday. The, it's all before Friday at 6 p.m. So there's a lot that happens in three hours. Now, what this does is this sets up another thing but before we get in chapter 16. Is remember Jesus said three days uh, he'll be in the ground and he'll, he'll rise the third day. Well, the third day is not literally three 24-hour periods. It just means he's in the ground for three parts of a day uh, or parts of three days because Jesus is only in the ground on Friday for just a few short hours. And the reason for that is because he's going by Jewish time. And Jewish time, the day begins at 6 p.m. And the new day, uh, the day ends at 6 a.m. So he's in the ground an hour or so, uh, maybe two, uh, on the last on, on the Passover, the Friday before the Passover, before Sabbath, uh, when they're going to take the Passover, uh, is the first day. And then he's in the ground all day Saturday. That's the second day. And then he's in the ground Sunday night, what we call what we would call Saturday night, but Sunday night and into Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, we get to Mark 16. And Mark 16 begins with the women. Uh, early on the first day of the week, uh, there was these angels who came and they rolled the stone back. Uh, the guards fell down uh, and they were fell down as if they were struck, as if, as if they were uh, they were terrified. And the women come to the tomb and they find the tomb empty. Uh, 
They find the tomb, the stone rolled back. Matter of fact, they, they, they get close to the tomb, and I forget which account it is, that talks about that they say, oh, well, they talk about us. I like, well, who's going to roll the stone away? None of us can roll the stone away where they can where we can get to the body because they're coming to to treat the body. What they would do is they would wrap a body in, in linen cloth and they'd put aloe and perfume on it to make it not smell so bad. They'd mummify it. It's a way of mummifying the body. Uh, not exactly like the Egyptians did, but it's a form of it. And they're coming to do that, but they come in and they see the tomb roll, the stone rolled away. They see the guards no longer there and they run. Uh, they run back to the apostles. And then what we see in the next part, verses 9 through 14, we see Jesus starts to make his appearances. And this is one of the telling things of the gospel is that you have these, these people who uh, days earlier were afraid of, of, of the Jews, were run away, but now they are believers. Now they're strong and they're standing for God. And the reason for that is because Jesus appeared to them. First, he appears to Mary Magdalene, one of the women who was there. Mary plays a very important part over and over again when she, we see Jesus. And Jesus comes to her and speaks to her, uh, and he sees her. Uh, then verse 12 and 13, he appears to two other disciples. Uh, then finally in verse 14, he later appears to 11. Now, John and other gospels tell us more about these appearances, uh, but Jesus makes these multiple appearances. What he does, he wants people to have eyewitness. He wants people to know that he is alive, uh, that he is there, uh, that he is risen. And after he appears to 11 in verse 14, he tells them to come and meet him on the mountain. Uh, and then we see the end of this, this book, uh, verse 15 to 16, we see what we call the Great Commission, uh, where Jesus tells his apostles to go into all the world. Go, go with the mission. Go and preach the gospel, the good news, the message. And Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection, and, re and the appearance of Jesus after that resurrection. Uh, it's Jesus is coming back because as we said, there have been people in history who have died. There have been people in history who have been resurrected. We let's see that in the Bible. But none of those people who have been resurrected rose to never die again. All those people in the Bible who died and were resurrected, they came, they died again. Lazarus died again. Uh, the widow's son died again. The widow of Nain that he raised, she died again. All these people that he rolled, he, he raised from then, they died again. Even once his apostles were raised, they died again. Jesus is the only one who died and came back and never died a second time. And therefore, he tells them to go and preach this gospel, this gospel message, his message that if we believe that same thing, we will have a part of that resurrection. And then verse 17 and 18, he promises them that if they remain true, uh, they follow his word, they teach in his way, he'll give them divine assistance. They'll do miracles. And this is something we see the apostles do in the book of Acts. They are able to do miracles to prove, again, that their message is from God. Because if you saw people, um, if we would have been able to see the miracles the apostles did, uh, we would we, we would have a total different reaction to 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 to. to, to to Jesus, to the gospel, uh, to, to church, to faith, uh, because that's what we do. And that's what we read this. We read these accounts and we're, we're amazed at. Imagine seeing it. Uh, and so Jesus says, I'll give you this. I'll do this for you. Why? To give you proof. And then we finally see that, um, that he goes up in verses 19 and 20. We have what's called his ascension, his final ascension into heaven, where he uh, raises up into the clouds to never come back again until the second coming. Uh, he departs from earth. Uh, after he stayed on earth for um, for about 50 days, no, not 40, 50 days. Uh, I forgot how long he stayed on earth when he comes, but he finally ascends into heaven before the Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. Um, and so he confirms the word. Uh, he confirms the word that he's spoken to him by the signs and miracles they're able to do. And therefore, we have this, this, this book of Mark uh, that shows us this, this gospel story. Uh, that is, as Mark said in Mark 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here we have the end. His ascension is the end of the gospel. It's the end of that message about who Jesus was. And I hope that you've gotten a little bit out of this class as we went through this. I hope you've gotten an understanding of who Jesus is, what he came to do. He came with a purpose. Uh, he came with a plan, a plan that he was going to die on the cross, that he was going to redeem mankind, that he would offer salvation. That's that great, this, this great commission. That whoever believes is baptized shall be saved. Whoever does not believe shall be damned, uh, shall be condemned. Uh, that idea, that, that, that's, that, that's a simple message. 
You either believe and obey and be a servant, be a disciple, or you refuse. You don't believe. You have to choose. In the book of Mark, as we've said over and over again, all the gospel brought for this purpose is to show us who Jesus is. And when it gives us who Jesus is, we have to choose. Is Jesus the Christ? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? Or, or is he nothing? I'll end with this. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but C.S. Lewis, uh, he wrote the, if you ever watched the movies and, or read the books, The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, he was a great writer and great Christian thinker. Uh, he once said, and, and I, I've never heard it put better than what he said, he once said that to look at Jesus and to look at the Gospels and to look at everything the Bible says about him, Jesus has to be one of, one of three elves. He says, there's three L's that, that can describe Jesus. And he's one of those three. And he says, you have to choose for yourself which one he is. The first one is that he's a liar. That Jesus was a liar. That he wasn't the son of God. He wasn't uh, bringing a gospel. He wasn't establishing a kingdom. His disciples were liars. Uh, that all they did and all that they've worked through throughout history has just been a major lie, major deception. Uh, that he would to say he's a liar would say there was no resurrection. That the disciples came, they stole his body, uh, they moved his body. There's a lot of things we can look at and argue about that. This is the idea: is that Jesus was nothing but a regular man who was a very good con artist. He was a con artist. He was a liar. Or number two that's uh, maybe not as bad. He's a lunatic. Uh, he's a lunatic. He's out of his mind. He wasn't God, son of God. He wasn't uh, a savior. He wasn't any of those things. He, he was crazy. And he got these 12 men to believe all of his craziness. And he got these millions or these thousands of people to believe his craziness. Uh, he's a lunatic. He's a madman. Uh, and therefore, he shouldn't be listened to. He shouldn't be regarded. Or, number three, the last L. He's Lord. If what Mark, Matthew, Luke, John say about him is true, if the miracles are true, if he is the son of God, then he has to be Lord. If he is the one he claims to be, then he has to be Lord. And as Lord, we have to acknowledge him as Lord. We have to acknowledge him as the one, the master over all things the master over all the earth, the master who will save us and who will redeem us. As you can guess, I, you can see where I think he is. But as you grow up and as you develop your faith, you're going to have to answer that question. How do you see Jesus? And not how do you say Jesus is, but how do you live? How do you act? Do you act like Jesus is a liar or a lunatic? That he, he may have been a good man, but he wasn't Lord. He wasn't the one to worry about. Or do we recognize him as Lord? Do we recognize him as the one who came to this earth to die for us, to redeem us, to make us whole, to make us his people? What do we believe about God? What do we believe about Jesus? Again, we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but we're running out of time tonight and this class is over. Uh, but I want you to really think about that. I want you to think about it yourself. And as you go forward, where do you see Jesus? What is he to you? Is Jesus the liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? What do you think? And if you ever have a question, uh, anything, any question at all about any of that, talk to me. I would love to sit down and talk to you about this. But it's not wrong to have questions. I want to tell you that too. It's not wrong to question anything you believe. If you cannot question what you believe and find out a good answer, that's probably a good, good thing you don't, or it's, it's maybe something you don't need to believe. Maybe something you need to look at. Everything we believe, everything we do, it ought to have an answer. It has a purpose. And it's not because we've always done it that way. It's all, not because you don't need to ask questions. Is that we need to study. We need to read. Because you're going to run into people, and you, you probably you may have already run into it now, I don't know, but you're going to as y'all get it older and get into college. You're going to see people who, who take religion, and, and you've seen it on TV and in other places, that take religion, take the belief of Christ, and they say you're crazy. They're, they, they say he's a lunatic. He's crazy, and you're crazy if you believe him. Well, the ones who say that are the ones who haven't really looked at him, who haven't really thought about him, processed what was there, what Jesus did, what Jesus accomplished. And so I want you to know that it's okay to question, but don't question without finding answers. Look, study, 
look for yourself. And again, I can say this, I've been there. Uh, when I was out of high school, in a high school and going into college, uh, even when I started to get, begin preaching, I would often, often think about that and try to answer, okay, am I doing the right thing? Is Jesus who he says he is? And in all the studying and all the, the looking I've done, you, you see the answer I've come up with. And I'd be more than, more than happy to help you with that because you'll find that all four of the gospel accounts say the same thing, that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the Son of God, he is your Savior. He is your Redeemer if you'll come and live for Him and follow Him. Again, I thank you for being here. I know this has been a little odd of having to do class this way, but I appreciate your patience and patience bearing with us with this Zoom classes and this uh, meeting virtually. Uh, it's meant a lot that we've been able to, to bet this way. I've greatly enjoyed our time together. Uh, but like I say, next Sunday or Sunday, we look forward to getting in class. Uh, I hope you all have a good class. And again, if you ever need anything, don't, don't hesitate to come talk to me. Uh, but for tonight, we're going to stop our recording right there. Uh, and we hope that you all have a good rest of the week, rest of the school year. And we hope to see you all uh, Sunday morning at church. Thank you.